And today, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome um, Professor Matthew Thompson for our uh, first lecture uh, of the series. He's a headliner for us, and I'm delighted to welcome him. He is assistant professor of music at the University of Michigan, and he has taught a number of courses, including a massively popular uh, class, uh, video game music. Uh, you should probably check it out. Before you leave here, you might want to mm. take it whenever he offers that course next. Uh, he also serves as a vocal coach for graduate voice students and as a pianist. Uh, he's very multi-talented, obviously. As a pianist, he has performed uh, with a lot of celebrities, uh, Tony Award winners, um, and uh, he has performed on many, uh, with many um, music teams, uh, the Ann Arbor Symphony Chamber Music Series, the Detroit Chamber Winds and Strings Series, and the Great Lakes Chamber Music Vignette Series, among others. Uh, he's also artistic director for the uh, uh, Carolyn Mulby Chorale, based in Flint, Michigan, which was recently featured in the Netflix ori original series, Flint Town. Um, and you can also see his performances on YouTube. He has his own YouTube channel, Caroline Moby Corral's uh, YouTube channel, uh, and many other places. And he also uh, released recording with UM alumnus and oboist, Dr. Alex Hayashi, a uh, CD entitled Japonica that he has right here. Um, and he, is, he became one of the first collegiate uh, pedagogue mm -hmm. <laughs> instructors to use video game music as a teaching tool uh, when he created this popular uh, video game music class. Okay. So we are delighted to welcome him and he's here to talk about his um, video game music and his love of that uh, and how he got interested in Japanese culture, uh, video games and so on. So please join me in welcoming Professor Thompson. Thank you, it's really an honor to be here today I thought before I jump into the topic for today, I would explain a little bit about how I came to be here in front of you in the room. As my introduction was uh, made, it said that I have a, I play with opera singers and instruments and all sorts of things like that. I have a degree in what they call collaborative piano, which means I can still play by myself and I do occasionally, but most of the time I'm working with singers and instruments or playing with choirs or orchestra or something like that, rather than by myself. And as part of that work, I met a friend of mine who's really integral part of what I'm talking about today, Alex Hayashi, the oboe player. We were having dinner at Tomuku down off of State Street in 2015. And he said, I'm interested in doing a recital, one of my dissertation concerts of all Japanese composed oboe music. Would you like to play that? And that was immediately interesting to me. I had a doctorate in music I was teaching here. And what my response to him was, was, well, I can list very many Japanese composers, but they're all video game composers. I can't list any classical Japanese composers. So he said, well, I'm trying to figure out a way to connect my upbringing and culture with this Western art I've been studying for years. I'm about to have a doctorate in, and a project like this would be a perfect pairing. <coughs> so we had such a good time working together that I looked for other repertoire that is less known. I wanted half of it to be composed by women. And we were eventually able, through the generous support of the CJS, to create Japonica. We've now played this concert, or versions of this concert, in different places in the US. We played it in Europe. Um, it's available for streaming. It's available for purchase. And it's, uh, it, I'm just delighted to put this repertoire out. And in wanting to give back to the CJS for that support, I'm here today to talk about something that really connects with modern audiences, video game music. So how did I start teaching this class? That's the last piece of background information I want to give you. In 2012, the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs from the School of Music, Theater, and Dance called me. And she said, you have this skill for reaching out beyond just music students. And we are looking for classes that would be of broad appeal and interest to a lot of different majors. Do you have any ideas? And I said, oh, yes. You know, I was working with opera singers. So I said, oh, something about words and music and the connection of all the things, the way those come together and language and culture. And then I hung up the phone. And about 30 seconds, I called back. And I said, I don't know why I said that. I just said it because that's what my doctorate says I should say. What I want to really do is teach a class on video game music. 
And she said, that's it. Tell me more. So I spent a year and a little bit more reading everything I could that was academically published on the subject, which in 2012 was not so much. Now there's a whole lot more. I don't think I'm the best person in the field, but here is this wave of research interest, and here was me. <laughs> so that worked out in my favor pretty well. Um, and I started this class. The very first incarnation had 66 people in it, um, and it continues to be extremely popular. If enrollment is typical, in next semester, I, more than a thousand students will have taken this class with me since I created it. Many of them have gone on to the field, the industry. Others of them take it because they don't even play video games and have no idea how somebody's going to talk about the music in them for a whole semester. But I, I do. <laughs> and they just want to know more, and that's all fine with me. So anyway, on to today's topic. As part of my research, I have a list of all the video games I've ever played in my life. And there are 143. I was just looking at it in preparation for this talk today. And I thought to myself, how many of these have Japanese created audio? Now, I'm going to pause before I give you that answer because uh, there needs to be some sort of standard. There needs to be something to compare me, my one person, against. When I teach my video game music class, as an icebreaker discussion, this proves to me students can post and understand how to have the discussion forums run the way I want them. I ask on the first assignment, what is your favorite game audio and why? And I looked back at some historic data. In fall 2017, 41% of games that students mentioned in this discussion had Japanese composed audio. And in winter 2018, 39. So basically, we're looking at about 40% for almost everyone who takes a class as an undergrad, so we're looking at our undergraduate population right here at Michigan, seems to ring in around 40% Japanese-based. So what about me? I'm a little older, whatever, you know, I'm also <laughs> have different tastes. Well, it turns out 68%, so more than two out of three games that I've played have Japanese-created audio. I, I thought, well, how is that? How is, it's, I knew that I had a big interest in this. I mean, I know for myself as a gamer, I want to play RPGs. I'd rather play Final Fantasy. I want to play platformers. I'd rather play Mario. I want to play uh, Action Adventure. I'd rather play Legend of Zelda. I'm probably not going to play, you know, MMORPGs. I can remember putting World of Warcraft into my computer, and then I pressed eject, and I thought I'd rather get a doctorate. <laughs> And uh, sports games, I mean, I have played them, but I'm not probably going to purchase FIFA. I'm not a first-person shooter guy. I mean, I love Halo. I love Marty O'Donnell. He just asked me to record a piano piece he wrote that's never been recorded or performed. That's coming out later this year. But uh, that's just not the kind of material I myself play. But I wonder if there's more to it than that. In 2001, the Michigan Daily published an article titled, The Best Music We've Ever Sat in Front of the Television For. And this was a list of the, the, what these two editors thought was the best video game music that they had grown up with. Well, in 2001, I also was an undergraduate student. So I'm similar in age to these two people. And it's incredible to me that 10 out of the 11 games they mention were Japanese composed. And the one that's not is Tetris, which the version they reference is Game Boy, which came from Japan and had some Japanese composed music in it by Hip Tanaka. So part of me is wondering, is this generational? And if I had made a graph of the games I played, when I was young, I was playing Atari. I got it out of the closet from my parents and uh, plugged it in and played it. Those were a lot of American games. But then out came NES. Then out came Sega and the PlayStation, Sony. And all of a sudden, I was playing way more Japanese-based games. If I played computer games, which I did at times, those were probably American. But because of the consoles that were so popular when I was growing up, I think that I have more of a tendency toward Japanese games. So I hope that this background, having played 143 games, two out of three of which were composed by Japanese audio teams, makes me authoritative enough to speak today about this. If I ever do a talk, on game audio, I have to talk about Space Invaders. This game changed um, video game history. Uh, 
there is a unique connection here between the audio and the gameplay. This is the first continuous soundtrack, people argue what that means, maybe, in a video game. It has a bass line that goes dun, 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 dun. And as you kill the invaders, as you're about to see, it speeds up. That's a passacaglia, we would call that in classical music, this four note descending, repeating bass line. You'll hear, as you watch the footage, a mothership comes out on top. This is from the early era of creation of games where they're trying to mimic pinball machines and arcade machines. So we have a lot of that sound here. So I want you to watch this and pay attention to the way that the sound and the music interact with the gameplay. He still gets the win, don't, don't worry, he still gets the win, but he did lose a life. This game was so successful that it was rumored to have caused a coin shortage in Japan, which I have since read was actually a marketing ploy. There was actually not a coin shortage. But it is true that shop owners cleared out their wares of what they were normally selling to set up these arcade machines to cash in on the craze that people were having. There's an American version of a game similar to this, Asteroids. I don't know if anybody's ever played that. I find it to be uh, totally unsuccessful because the difference here is that, as you can see, the gameplay is speeding up and getting more difficult. And in Asteroids, at the very end, the music is going da 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 and it's the easiest gameplay. So the music almost becomes annoying instead of more engaging and driving you. Uh, Space Invaders was made by, and I'm sorry my Japanese is so terrible, Tomohiro Nishikado. This is from the era when a person who made a game did everything. His degree was in engineering. He studied at Tokyo Denki. He would have created the gameplay and all the different parts of it in addition to the sound. And in engineering, I mean, excuse me, in interviews, he said that he was hoping the sound of the bass dun, dun, Done, would mimic the human heartbeat and increase anxiety in players. So they were already in this very early era trying to t uh, get into your emotions and get you more deeply involved in the game. Another very important uh, game composer and just composer and conductor in general, Koichi Sugiyama. Has anybody played a Dragon Quest game or a Dragon Warrior it was in America when I was young? He is considered to be, uh, Nobuo Uematsu, who I'm about to get to, considers Sugiyama to be the big boss of video game music. Other people call him the grandfather of video game music. He had a successful career making music for television and commercials and also as a conductor and orchestrator. And he wrote to what is now Square Enix a fan letter and said, I'm really enjoying your shogi game. And they couldn't believe that someone of that stature had written and responded and said, would you like to make music for some of our games? And it turns out that that collaboration on the Dragon Quest series has become his most famous work. So let's hear a little bit of that. This is the title screen for 
music for Dragon Warrior or Quest, depending, it, it got changed in translation when it came over. I was just talking to somebody about localization differences. Uh, here's that title screen music. is not just important for his compositions in video games. One of the other huge things he did for video games is in 1986, he was the first person to record video game music with an orchestra. And he also created the idea of a video game music concert, which I, have, I don't know if anybody's been to. I go to them and review them. Because when I read reviews of video game music concerts, they're either people who love games but have no idea about music and they're just so happy they're hearing something from Kingdom Hearts, or they're people who know a lot about music and nothing about video games and they're angry that the orchestra isn't playing Beethoven. So <laughs> I'm somewhere in between those two. It works out well. Uh, in, so in 1987, uh, in, uh, where was it? Suntory Hall in Tokyo, he put on a concert called the Family Classic Concert. And now, as of today, his music has appeared in over 50 video games. I cannot do a lecture without speaking about Koji Kondo. And I, I'm glad to put a highlight onto these composers. I can remember a music professor friend of mine going down the hall who plays video games. He tends to play first-person shooters, so we don't usually play the same ones. He said, do we even know who wrote the music to Super Mario Brothers? Yes. <laughs> um, and again, this is from the era before anybody even thought they were going to be a video game composer. If you look at Kondo's notes from Super Mario Brothers, what he's writing out is computer code. He's not writing out a score like we would you know, get from Beethoven. He was a visual um, artist, but Nintendo put up a flyer at Osaka University where he was studying, and he just said, hey, I'd like that job. They didn't ask for demos or anything. And he just has gone on to become, of course, one of the most important audio composers for games ever. He's made the music to over 100 games. Is there anyone who does not know the Super Mario Brothers music? Ding. OK, one. Thank you for being honest. It's fine. That's great, actually. Thank you. In that same Michigan Daily article from 2001, the editors ventured to guess that if they polled the, the student body, they could not find someone who couldn't at least hum you the music, the theme to it. So because you're here, we're going to listen to a little bit of Super Mario Brothers. In this example, I've left the sound effects in. That's to remind me in part to say these composers were really working hard. The sound effects. Super Mario Brothers is in the key of C. Actually, Super Mario 1, 2, and 3 are all in the key of C. So he's already thinking kind of like a composer would with a symphony of making music in different areas related in terms of pitch. The sound effects are all also related in pitch. So the famous one-up sound da -da 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 -da, is just an arpeggiation with an added ninth of a C major chord. There is a lot of planning to this audio. So here is stage 1-1 one, one for Super Mario Brothers.
think if you went around the world and asked people if they knew that, you would get a similar response to what was in this room. I can tell you if I had written that music, I would think I had made it, that I had hit all my life goals. <laughs> the whole world can sing your music. What else do you want? Fascinating to me is that this music is composed so minimalistically in a way. For the NES, there were five sounds possible at once, the Nintendo Entertainment System. It had a sample channel, which was rarely used because the sample, that's like a, I've recorded a drum. It took so much memory, it was not really useful. You had two pulse waves, which typically were used for melody. Those were at the top. You had a triangle wave that was used for the bass, and you had a noise channel, and this was used for percussion. And these melodies that are now played by orchestra and have been famous for 30 or more years were made just using these sounds right here. I love this visualization. It comes from the YouTube channel I list down at the bottom. I think it can really help your ear to hear what's going on and you realize how limited and yet how expressive this music can be. and for people who are maybe not music majors, seeing that visualization being put through an oscilloscope lets you hear it a little bit more deeply than you would otherwise. Hardware. Nintendo from the very beginning has been genius in terms of audio hardware. So here, uh, uh, the Nintendo Entertainment System that I played was different in America than the Famicom system was in Japan in one really critical way in terms of audio, which is that the Famicom had a uh, microphone, as you can see for the second controller up there, and the uh, American version did not have a microphone. And I found this to be really frustrating when I was young, because I, this, was the, this is in the manual from The Legend of Zelda, and the monster pulls voice, the big-eared thing you see there. It says, a ghost with big ears and a weak point, he hates loud noise. I can remember as a kid, I used to, I tried to set off a bomb in the room, but I didn't do anything. You had a a whistle that you could play, a recorder. I would play that. That didn't kill it. I couldn't understand. Well, it was because they had taken that part out and actually made them in America weak against arrows. But if you were playing the Famicom version, you could make noise or blow or some sort of sound into the microphone and it instantly killed all of these monsters. So they were already thinking about ways to use audio in the gameplay. Think about it. The Wii, if, did anybody play a Wii ever? Yeah, that's, I'm getting into the era where you've actually played these. <laughs> uh, that had a speaker in the controller. The sound quality was terrible, but it brought the sound right to you. You were hearing it not just from your TV. It took Sony until PlayStation 4 in 2013 to put any kind of speaker attached to their controller. Nintendo has always had an awesome audio team. Not just Nintendo, but other Japanese companies um, wanted to improve the music as well. This is a very famous example, Vampire Killer from Castlevania, and then I'm going to play it from Castlevania 3. I just butted the sound and gameplay of 1 up against the sound and gameplay of 3. I didn't make any other changes. Turns out, you see the name of the composer of this piece there, it turns out she worked on the game for a few weeks and then left the development team. And it wasn't known until recently in interviews 
that this piece was not made by Kinoyu Yamashita, who took over, but instead by Terashima. So we're, we're learning some things that have happened. But the credits of games in this time are a disaster. The credits to Legend of Zelda, Koji Kondo, that I was just playing you, do you think it says sound composer Koji Kondo? No. It says sound composer Konchan. They didn't think that these were anything to even pay attention to. They had no idea that it would be their biggest <laughs> moment of their life. And so uh, when you look at these old games, it's very difficult to determine what's going on. So what happened between one and three was that a, a computer company, Konami, realized they could put additional sound chips that allowed three extra sounds into the game cartridge and that this would improve the sound. So what you're hearing here is the original, which only uses those four sounds we were just looking at on the screen, and then one that has even more sounds possible because of a VRC6 chip added. tremendous technological and musical progression over the lifetime of a system, but now I want to jump into when we go across systems and spend a bit of time with probably my favorite video game composer, Nobuo Uematsu. He has composed for the Final Fantasy series. Uh, he's often called the Beethoven of video game music, and believe me, in a hundred years when people look back at significant music of our time, these composers I'm showing you today are going to be on the list. There is no question. I prefer to think of him as the Mozart of, our, of video game music because he's so good with melody. And I think Koji Kondo is, I mean, he's also good with melody, but is very good with rhythm. And that's what I think of when I think of Beethoven. But in interviews, Uematsu often says the problem is not for him as a composer coming up with a melody. It's getting all the melodies going in his head at once to be quiet so he can just focus on one. What a problem to have, right? I played a lot of his games growing up because I was very into role-playing games. And back in the 90s when I was playing, they didn't have the space for voiceover as they do today. And so in order to get you to have the right feeling, the music played a really central role along with the text you were reading. One of my favorite facts about Uematsu is that he has a BA in English. Again, this is before people would ever think that they would be a video game composer. There's a famous song from Avenue Q that is, uh, what do you do with a BA in English? What is my life going to be? Well, you could become one of the most famous composers of video game music ever. So there are a lot of options. He never really had formal music training and his music is played today in symphony halls around the world. I have here a couple examples. The first one is the theme of love from Final Fantasy IV. It's my understanding that this is taught in, uh, or was for a time taught in Japanese public school as an important melody to know, kind of like we learn Yankee Doodle in America. Um, I would love it if somebody could confirm that or not. I don't actually know. I've never met someone who said yes, this was part of their education, but I would like you to hear this. And in the questions afterward, let me know if you can prove that to me. <laughs> oh, and there's nothing like silence before a big theme.
I did an interview a few years ago when I ran the only scholarly conference on video game music in North America here at U of M, uh, 2018, on Michigan radio with Lester Graham. And he was asking me about some of the most influential video game music to me, and I mentioned the opera scene from Final Fantasy VI. I don't know if people are aware of this. I'm going to play my most extended clip here of this opera for you today. Uh, I was so excited as a kid who loved classical music and opera and singing and all that sort of stuff when the character said to me, they say to you right before you go on stage to, to act in this opera, be careful that you read the score to check your words and staging. And I was like, I'm going to be an opera star and just went out on the stage and didn't know my words or my staging. It's one of those nightmares that you have as a performer. And the whole thing winds to a halt, which would never, of course, happen. You would keep going in real life. but. Um, it takes about 20 minutes to get back to that point again. So I was really punished to have to replay, but I was very careful to read the score before I went on stage the second time. In Final Fantasy VI, Uematsu gives each main character a light motif, And what that is is a musical theme that represents them. But when you meet the female singer who is going to do the second scene, I've sort of put these edits together to make a shortened version because otherwise this would be... 20 minutes or 30 minutes itself. Um, she doesn't have a theme, this, this female character. It just continues to play the same music that's been playing in the background the whole time. So after she sings in this opera, the opera theme becomes her theme in the video game. It's really clever. Check this out. Um, thank you for indulging me with the longest clip I'm going to show you. It's just so fascinating. It was hard to make cuts and as I was studying years ago to start teaching a music appreciation course, there's an old adage that you're always better to let people hear music and think about it on their own than it is to talk about the music that you wish they were hearing. <laughs> so. right here that you're about to hear. That actually becomes the main character's theme in Final Fantasy VII. Eris theme. Here it is again.
This has to me an unbelievable amount of musical sophistication, parody. I just, I love it. I can't get enough of this. And the idea for me that a, a man with no formal training would want to blend East and West. I mean, I'm married to a Korean. I'm in the trenches with that idea every, every day of life. This, this blending, this, I mean, that's the whole reason I wanted to make Japonica. So how, what are these Japanese classical things? This is just one of my favorite and most influential scenes. So thank you for indulging me with that. Last composer I want to look at today, Yoko Shimomura. Now we're to the era where people are actually probably having been trained as musicians if they're getting into this field. No longer do you need to be so adept at coding and things like that. She studied uh, at Osaka College of Music and was a piano major. And she played games. Unlike these other people, they couldn't really grow up playing games. There was no market for that. She wrote a fan letter to Capcom and sent some demos with it. And they said, hey, that's great. You want to make some music? And she went on to make music for, of course, her first hit was Street Fighter II. And then uh, Super Mario RPG she made the music for. Final Fantasy XV, the Kingdom Hearts series. So basically every series she's worked on in some way. Very impressive and beautiful. And I love that she loves to use piano and oboe in her writing often. I'm going to play two tracks for you from Kingdom Hearts. Again, I, I don't know why I'm into title music today, but this is title screen music. It's a piano piece. And when I play concerts of video game music, sometimes I often play this piece. It's a theme in variations. First, uh, uh, the theme is played, and then three variations follow. That's an old form. Think of Bach with the Goldberg variations, if you know that piece. These are tried and true um, compositional methods. And then the next thing I'm going to play you is how this piece sounded in Kingdom Hearts 3, which just came out this year. last chord is actually the Final Fantasy opening arpeggio chord. Because Kingdom Hearts and Final Fantasy share characters and motives. I love that piece. It works so well in concerts because it's an enclosed piece of music I could just sit and play and be done. In Kingdom Hearts 3, I remember turning this on and being so overwhelmed with how this sounded, it immediately became a life goal that I play this with orchestra, as you're about to hear, uh, myself before I die. Um, you know, I really love myself the early electronic sounds we were first listening to earlier in the lecture because they're so unique and they, they 
definitely mean you're hearing video games. People today are making chip tunes and whatnot. But the expressivity of a full orchestra playing, you can't, you can't top that. Music has become a part of the franchise branding with these games. And um, Kingdom Hearts 3 is actually on tour right now. It plays in uh, Atlanta. Uh, there's a symphony concert on Saturday, and then it goes to Paris and Mexico and Brazil and Australia, and then it finishes up in Osaka in November. So these kind of tours of orchestral things are going on all the time. Wow, I would love to hear this one uh, played live. I'd love to be playing this one live. <laughs> pleased to say I over blew the sound system as you heard with the static there so that was well worth it um, can you believe that as a piano major when she graduated her family thought it was beneath her to work on video games why didn't she get a respectable job like a teacher and yet I'm certain she would have never had the impact or audience for her music that she does today if she had been to finish up in my last 10 minutes here I want to talk a little bit about some research I'm doing currently um, last academic year, I believe, as far as I can tell, I became the first person ever to create a collegiate studio of piano majors or piano students. And uh, a fantastic group of five. And this was supported by the CRLT Faculty Development Fund. I was asking questions like, how does studying with video game music in a private instruction sort of setting change student motivations? If your summer reading is play Chrono Trigger so that you can find some themes you like from it, you know, does that change outcomes in some way? We had a lot of success. We played a, concerts around different places. It was really fun. Uh, I called this one Press A Flat to Play actually because that Kingdom Hearts Dearly Beloved is in A Flat and I knew I was going to be playing it. I thought that was kind of clever. Um, here I'm playing the Final Fantasy prelude with, uh, in a duet with uh, the doctoral student who was studying with me. There was lots of interest from audience members and from, I probably just by word of mouth had um, 20, over 20 applicants for four to five spots. So that was really exciting to me. And I think in an age where it seems like there's less interest in playing instruments, this repertoire is a great way to connect with people. Uh, I have here, I, I brought some of these t today, and at the end, uh, in a couple minutes when I'm done, if you want to come up and look through them, I just have to make sure one, two, three, four, five, six, 
seven. I have all of them back when I leave. These are all of the video game piano scores I've been able to collect over the years. I have 64. I don't actually have 64 on this slide. What just happened? Okay. Oh, I see. Um, 64. 50 of them, which are here appearing on the screen, are from Japanese-based game collections, and 40 of those 50 are exclusively, if there's anything written in them, it's in Japanese. Only 14 of 64 that I have spent years collecting are in English and American. Three quarters of all of the published materials I can find of video game piano music are Japanese in, in nature. And it's very hard to figure out where these are and, and what exactly they are because they really just exist. Music stores will have them in Japan, but you can't do a Google search and see what their inventory is. I sent um, my friend oboe player here in Japonica, who is also my translator whenever I'm doing things, went over to play some concerts in Japan and I said, could you go to the music store? You know my library, because he's been translating things for me for years. I said, you know my library, can you purchase? I have a budget, can you purchase some of these? And he found, by going to one store, he found 14 that I didn't have. So it's clear to me that I need to go over and do some investigation. When you open up some of these, for instance, this is in the Kingdom Hearts book, we have a um, letter from the composer Yoko Shimomura and um, uh, Alex, Dr. Hayashi translates this as white and black keys, black symbols written on white paper. Beginning is monochrome. From there, the music brings color. You are the one who will bring that color to the music. So she's writing a note to the performers, the people who are going to play this music, about how important their personal addition is. This collection is great. It has a four-movement sonata in it and all kinds of amazing things. This comes from a um, Legend of Zelda. Uh, collection. This is the Song of Healing from Majora's Mask. A lot of these Japanese pieces have some text at the beginning of them, which is very interesting to me. This is not typically an American thing you see. Alex translates this as, this is the same motif as the clock tower, but please play this pianistically. In other words, do not be so square. Use slight push and pull with the tempo and play the melody singingly. Please use the pedal at C to smoothly play the wide arpeggio in the left hand. And uh, m one of my favorite quotes from any of these works is at the beginning of this, the note that the uh, publishers have left you is, there's no question you'll be popular among your friends after performing these in front of them. <laughs> uh, other comments you might see are suggestions for how to practice or insider information about the game. And one of the things, oh, I, I didn't mention this. In the upper left, you can see it says uh, some information in 85. Alex translates this as equivalent to Bayer 85. Well, who is Bayer? I have a doctorate in piano, and I'd never heard of Bayer's until I started doing this research. And it's really cool. UM actually has an extensive collection of his music, it turns out. Who would know? He was a German um, composer and primarily piano teacher. And his teaching method was, until about the last 20 years, the way that piano was taught to beginners in Japan. I see some people nodding. I had no idea it existed until just recently. And so what they're doing is they're saying here, if I ever do this lecture and I have a piano, I play these examples, but maybe if you can just look at the music, you can get a sense. Okay, so equivalent to Bayer 75, Alex would translate that as. So here down here is Bayer 75, and here up at the top is Chrono Trigger Peaceful Day. So they're saying if you've mastered this exercise, you can also master this piece. This is a fascinating pedagogic connection to me because video game music has elements of rock and roll and jazz and popular music that didn't exist in 1850 when Bayer was making these exercises. So how exactly much connection is there is something I'm studying. And another thing I've just recently learned is how did the Bayer method get to Japan? Well, there was a person, uh, Shuji Isawa, who came over to Boston. He studied at the Bridgewater Normal School. And Japan had sent him to study early curriculum, and um, when he was taking his music classes, he was really not good at them. And they were going to just write him an excuse note, and he said, no, I really want to get this. And he did. He mastered it. And when he went back to Japan, they asked him to make an uh, elementary music curriculum and a textbook. And he said, you know what would help me is if you would bring my teacher over, who was L.W. Mason, and they did from 1880 to 1882, Mason came over. When he came, he brought 20 copies of the Bayer method with him and 10 pianos. 
And this is how that got started. Mason had found it himself over in Germany looking for good um, early beginner material. And because he brought that, then after World War II, we have this big boom. They call it the music lesson boom or the piano lesson boom where people wanted to study this. And the teachers used Bayer and sort of supplemented it with these other methods. So finishing up here, where I'm going after this is uh, I, I really want to get in contact with these people. And it's very difficult. If you're wanting to talk to the composers, it's difficult to get in their contact information for a different reason. If you're wanting to talk to the people who are making these piano arrangements, it's, you can really find almost nothing about them in English. So I have to sit down with my translator and have him Google some things with me. But if you notice, no one in any of those pictures that I just showed you is young. And we can't ring up Beethoven or Mozart and say, hey, what did you mean when you wrote that? What was it like to collaborate? But you can still ring up these people for a, a little while. It's very important to, timing is everything. I'd like to know more about their biography, how they collaborated. You know, if somebody calls you and says, make some Super Mario music, I told you it doesn't exist in a printed version like Beethoven, it's computer code. What do they give to these arrangers? Do they have drafts and revisions? And frankly, I just want to go around to music stores, see what's there. Can I find 20 more things that I don't have and don't know? They're, they're really not published here in America. So I look forward to your questions. I have some things also I'd love if you looked through, but of course, leave them with me, please. Thank you for being a great audience. Yeah, oh, I'd love to, yeah. So we have 15 minutes for questions. Well, um, actually, and so, uh, sorry for presuming, but I guess I, I also had some comments, some Great. thoughts on some things you mentioned. Um, so first of all, you mentioned how um, with Castlevania and Castlevania III, um, they had the music in the third game where they added the, was it two more? Wait, three more three, channels three were possible. Three more sound channels. Mm -hmm. um, that didn't happen in the US though because the NES couldn't accommodate the- Oh, the added sound chip. Yeah, it couldn't uh, accommodate the added sound chip because the difference between Famicom cartridges and NES cartridges was such that it wasn't possible. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so I think you needed like extra connectors or something and the <laughs> NES didn't have it. That's in my brain somewhere, but I did not mention that today, yeah. So I thought, yeah, so I thought that was interesting. And then also, um, I think one thing that I've learned over time um, with video game music is when you talk about the early games, we were talking about the square wave and the triangle waves. Um, I learned that, um, I guess, as, as, you, yeah, as you go from like chiptune music to like Super Nintendo, which is less so, um, and then to like it's current music, which is where, you know, by the time I guess you reach the PlayStation, you can just record music and right. play it. From, um, I thought it was interesting thinking of the step in between with the Super Nintendo when you played the theme of love um, and mm. Final Fantasy VI, I know the, the sound chip, the SPC-700 um, in the Super Nintendo was designed by Ken Futaragi, mm. who is the guy who designed the, the PlayStation and PlayStation 2. And I believe there's some connection between Nintendo and Sony's relationship before it kind of went down in flames. <laughs> so I always thought that was an interesting historical connection because the Super Nintendo had very unique sound. It did. And so I thought that was cool that the designer of the PlayStation and PlayStation 2 and PlayStation 3 also designed the NES sound chip. So, or sorry, the SNES sound chip. Um, and I guess the last one, this is just a aside because I thought it was interesting. Um, when the Final Fantasy IV clip you played um, looked to be from a fan translation. It was a different translation, exactly. Okay, because, yeah, because it mentioned killed and in, right. in the original, in the 90s Nintendo, you couldn't say killed in a game. And also Kane's name was spelled with a C, C instead of a K. Mm -hmm. And in all official Nintendo, or I guess all official Final Fantasy localizations, it's always with a K. So I just thought that was interesting. I was like, oh, I'm trying to figure out where this translation's from. And then. It was uh, from uh, 3 a.m. when I was downloading <laughs> some tr uh, footage for yeah, that. Clip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, my understanding of the way that the Super Nintendo worked was that um, they were able to record a sound and use it as a sample and then modulate it in pitch. Okay. And so that's a different system than the sort of digital synthesis that we were looking at with the Nintendo or the Famicom. Okay, yeah, that's, that's interesting because um, I've, I've talked to some chiptune composers and it's really cool to see what they come up with nowadays. Yeah, I agree. First of all, uh, thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. And I went to uh, uh, element, uh, Japanese elementary school and uh, 
middle school, and I can confirm you that there's a, a final a score from Final Fantasy on the textbook. So it's perfect. There. Yeah. Although I didn't, uh, my teacher didn't talk about. It oh no! They left that one yeah. out. Because I must say, uh, music education in Japan is I in a uh, public Japanese school is uh, not really advanced. Mm. So yeah. But uh, I have two questions. Okay. First, uh, how how would the concept of Japanese game music affect? both performers and the audience, is there any difference when they are listening to like Western classical mm. music or other types of music? And the, the other one is uh, for the Japanese video game music started as, you know, figuring out how to use th those four uh, waveforms and do you think that that uh, origin as more like uh, coding rather than composing, is there any influence on, or like is there any legacy in today's uh, video, video game music? The further along, let me take the second one first. The further along you get in present day, the less technological knowledge that the people making the music need. So, um, Yes, I definitely think that uh, the fact that these people were fooling around with synthesizers and keyboards and whatnot, not necessarily um, the most advanced players themselves, but they liked computers and they liked the electronic aspect of the music and they liked um, music creation. They, they just came along at a perfect time to do that. Um, the other part of what you ask was sort of like what would be what what was the first one again something about performance of Japanese video game music the, the concept of Japanese video game as uh, Japanese video game music as a kind of a genre of music would that affect any performer or mm. audience I'm not sure when I think about well and when I think about video game music period, but particularly the, the 80s, the early era and 90s of Japanese audio, they were so influenced by jazz and rock and roll. I mean, Uematsu is playing guitar in a rock and roll band himself at the time he's making these pieces. They were interested in our popular forms and also obviously our classical forms. Um, I don't know how it would be necessarily different other than the audience that's going to be attracted to it is going to be into the video games maybe and not into another genre of music. That's one of the reasons I keep saying to UMS, please do a video game music concert, but they have retention numbers and it's, yeah, you can sell out Hill with a video game music concert, but 3% of those people will come back to see a classical concert. And yes, they love the fact that the demographic is 10 to 40 instead of 70 to 90, but that's not, it, it doesn't help them out for other ticket sales. So it's, it's a challenge in that way. So I think the audience is probably the main thing that's changed. When I, as a performer, am playing any of these things, I'm just trying to play it just as brilliantly as I would play. I mean, I think the music is worthy of whatever, but there's also a problem when I go to see, and when I say whatever, I mean the highest level of performance and attention. When I go to see the Detroit Symphony and they're playing a Legend of Zelda concert and I know many of the players, oh, the principal cellist isn't there, oh, the principal violin's out, oh, the entire brass section are my friends from UM instead of the normal brass people. They can't even get the players who should be playing the concert there. They're having all, all kinds of subs. So a lot of people just don't even think the music is really worthy, which to me is a shame. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you again for the uh, presentation. The um, uh, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of game design and, and um, especially the sound design, and I think there's a lot of really special things that, especially with the technological advances we have today, that people can pull off in games like mm -hmm. uh, Breath, Breath of the Wild or Nier Automata. Is there anything particularly like unique to game music that um, is 
in development or is to be or is 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 to come that you're excited for in the future? Well, I love the fact of right now that we have this orchestral level real players of music and yet um, the music is made to be interactive with your individualized gameplay. So people aren't hearing the same music. I mean, there are some pieces that are linear, but if you think about it, gameplay is nonlinear and music is linear. And so you have to figure out some way to work around that. And either you're going to loop the music, which was the early technique, or else you're going to make it interactive. So now the computer is choosing orchestral music that builds or diminishes depending on how you play. It's fascinating to me you ask about the future. My friends who have made music for Nintendo or Sony or something like that, Nintendo will not even send them a trial switch ahead of the Switch's release. They're so tight controlled about it. So they don't have any idea what the music is going to sound or be like in the games they're making it for. So what's going to be in the future? I don't know. If they won't send the people who are working on the current system a trial one before it comes out, uh, it's very tight-lipped about it. But I'm excited to go along for whatever the ride may be. Um, with the limited chip, uh, chip set of the time, do you think, it's kind of a two-part question, but uh, with the, inspire, uh, the creativity inspired, do you think that because of the limited chip set that they had at the time and the limited amount of music that they could make, it, it inspired creativity in the tracks? And uh, does that style of music still have effects to this day in the industry and current compositions that artists still make? Yeah, I, this is a great question. I absolutely do. In fact, I think one of the reasons that Uematsu is doing less now is because he was so creative based on being limited. And I think now that you can have full orchestra and everything can sound like a Michael Giacchino movie track or John Williams or whoever you may like, Joe Saishi can sound you know as orchestrally beautiful as you want, that's a different kind of complexity to pare yourself down. I have a friend who uh, composed the music to Bioshock, Gary Scheinman, and he, you know, he's very famous for using a string quartet in one scene. He could have had full orchestra for the whole game, but he narrowed it down. And I, there's a lot of in common with Baroque sound of these early games because you have those three channels, and it sort of gives you a, a polyphony like you would have with Bach. But um, that, that unique early era is just always a favorite for me. You immediately know it's from a game. So yes, there are limitations. Yes, certain composers thrived better under that. And um, I don't know, I, I love, there are games like it, DuckTales has been released and you can play it with an orchestral score or you can play it with an 8-bit score these days. I love the options that players are being given. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Fascinating uh, stuff. Uh, so I was, I was wondering, because uh, at some point you mentioned that the, the music of one of the games is really a kind of like East meet, meets West mm -hmm. kind of situation. I was wondering where that Eastern element is, because I, I can understand wha uh, where the Western element is. I mean, there is Western harmonies, like uh, uh, functional harmonies and stuff. Because uh, I, I was thinking about also the jazz group J Music Ensemble, based in New York, I think. Mm. They play Japanese anime and game music uh, with a jazz idiom. And uh, one of the members uh, was interviewed by a YouTuber, and he said, like, uh, in a lot of Japanese anime and game music, there's this, like, minor sixth interval, like... Mm, da, 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 da. Oh, I love you have kind training of here. Look at this. So so this is kind of... Uh, I was wondering if there's it's kind of sort of, like, almost like Japanese flavor that maybe characterizes some, some of the uh, game audio uh, that, that you have encountered. I, I mean, I think you already said that very well for me. You've almost answered your question in that. But um, uh, I am looking forward to, there are some games I could have posted, I think, or used examples from that maybe had a little bit more of an Eastern flavor. But um, I would have to think back to what exactly it is, but I'm certain there are ones that actually use, like, a, instead of oboe, they use a, what is it, a hikari or whatever. Isn't that the sort of Japanese equivalent to it? Um, oh, hichiki. Oh, thank you. Okay. I can't remember the name. Um, 
I would be really interested now in the orchestral era to see if some of those instruments start to cross. You know, there are games that take pipa, but the fascinating thing to me, if I start to think about a game that uses pipa, it's an American game, and they're trying to have flavor. So there is this blending. To me, the blending is strongly based in, in probably many of the examples I showed with rock and roll and things like that, but that's what these composers were really into. Yeah, I think uh, use of intervals and scales, and then there you get into all kinds of problems because the early game systems had tuning issues because of the electronics of it. So are they trying to have a certain flavor or is it just out of tune because the Nintendo couldn't make the right intervals? It's, it's a complicated question, but I, it's something I'm trying to explore more as I do my research. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Gave us very good topic and very interesting. Thank um, you. <coughs> my question is actually my uh, my younger period, maybe seventy percent of times are gaming, <laughs> brain gaming, so I can feel very emotional now. Mm. But uh, my question is, even though the those kind of music was emerged thirty years ago, we can we can feel very uh, we can feel emotional and. Uh, the brighter than before, those kind of music. My question is that usually typical music is uh, outdated if time, cons time is spending. Mm. But uh, those kind of music is very bright and uh, <coughs> uh, the more than famous than before. Mm -hmm. So how do you think why those uh, game music can expand and uh, we, we don't feel the outdated now? Yeah, a great question. Think about Christmas. At Christmas, you listen to music that even pre probably predates your grandparents. You know, you put on Frank Sinatra and stuff like that because we like this idea of nostalgia. And so for people my generation, I hear a chip tune and oh, this reminds me of my childhood. And so then what'll happen is our kids, if you have kids, you they start to hear that music and then they associate that with you and it sort of carries down. So I think it's a combination of love of nostalgia for before, which is in all music genres, and I also think it is a combination of how unique those chiptune sounds are to video games and to that era. That means people don't get tired of it and I, I, I mean, people call them bleeps and bloops and have some disdain for it. It's my favorite era. Now that it can sound like everything else, there's, that specialness is lost. But then again, I'm uh, about to turn 40, so maybe I'm just being nostalgic for my childhood. Thank you all so much for today. Yeah, but, uh, I want to give some time to uh, come up and yeah. take a look at some of these interesting yeah. scores and talk to Professor Thompson. Please join me in thanking Professor Thompson for Thank the wonderful you. presentation. Thank you.